a look at this passage of Scripture. Boy, my heart is going a lot of different directions this morning. It really is. I, I think of um, just different scenarios of life here. Brother Richard up in the hospital, and uh, my heart goes out to him. And may the Lord help us here today as we just get into the Word of God that He would help us to understand and not just know His Word, but may we follow His Word. And that's really the, the crux of this message here today. And so look at Joshua chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse number 1, and I'll read all the way down to verse number 9. The Bible says here, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. As uh, Johnny mentioned earlier, we're, this theme this year is on continue. And uh, our, our whole goal is to really walk through on Sunday mornings and to preach different messages about the Bible. You know, we've been given a heritage. I have a lot of people that have invested in my life, and I have a lot of heroes that are in Christian circles and uh, who have stood for the Word of God. And we're living in a day today where we have a lot of people that are stepping away from the Bible and preaching all sorts of other things. And it's very important that we come back to the doctrines and the fundamentals of the Word of God. And so this morning, I'm going to preach a message on this title, How Can I Have Success in This Life? And it really all revolves around this one book. Let's pray together. Lord, I just come before you today. I ask for your richest blessings upon this time that you would indeed speak to the hearts of each one that is here today. Would it be that we would put aside the cares of this world, the plans we have for this week, and may it be that our whole heart, soul, and mind would be focused on the Word of God. Help me today as I preach. I don't want this to be my message. I want this to be your message. May you come through and speak to hearts, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please notice the last word of verse number 8. In the King James Bible, which is the Bible that I use and we encourage to be used here, is the word success. You know, when people hear the word success, it causes them to take a little note and sit up and say, oh, a message on success. You know, we're all conditioned in this world 
to some degree or another to want success today. Get on Amazon or Google the word success books and you'll be stunned at not only the titles but the volume of books that has to do with success. Our world, sadly, is conditioned to want, desire, and chase after success. But I have a question for you today. What kind of success are we speaking about? It was in 1928 that there was a group of the world's most successful financiers met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. And the following men were present there. The president of the largest steel company at the time, the greatest wheat speculator, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, a member of the president's cabinet, the greatest bear on Wall Street, the president of the Bank of International Settlements, and the head of the world's greatest monopoly. Collectively, these tycoons controlled more wealth than there was in the actual United States Treasury. And for years, there were people that were saying, look to these people because if you want success, you follow these men. Well, some years later, in fact, within 25 years, here's what's happened to all these men. The president of the largest independent steel company, Charles Schwab, lived on borrowed money and the last five, year, the last five years of his life, and he died broke. The greatest wheat speculator, Arthur Kooten, died abroad bankrupt. The president of the New York Stock Exchange, Richard Whitney, served a term in Sing Sing Prison. The member of the president's cabinet, Albert Fall, was pardoned from prison so he could die at home. The greatest bear in Wall Street, Jesse Livermore, committed suicide. The president of the Bank of International Settlements, Leon Frazier, committed suicide. The head of the world's greatest monopoly, Ivar Druger, committed suicide. All of these men had learned how to make money, but not one of them had learned how to live. There's a desire within every one of us to eat and drink from the world's banquet of success. But I want to tell you, the world's standard of success is far different than what God has in his word. The world says, get all you can, all the wealth, all the possessions, achieve things, have fame, beauty, and intellectual acuity. And yet, as we learned in the illustration I just gave, those who have achieved those things have found themselves, when they got what they were looking for, they're not happy. They're still empty. So what kind of a success is Joshua speaking of here? Well, first of all, I must state this emphatically. God's measurement of success is not the same as the world's. Did you get that? God's standard, his measurement of what is success and what is not, is not the same as the world's. You see, success here in the world is measured in things and influence in society. But true biblical and godly success is measured by one's di dynamic relationship with God and his word, that is the Holy Scriptures. You see, success is not following the plans that are scripted in the hundreds and thousands of success books which line the bookstores today. But true success is found right here in this book following God's holy word. Now, you say this morning as you sit in your comfy little pew, you say, oh, come on, preacher, it's got to be better than that. That's the problem. You've gotten yourself caught up in the world. You have followed the world's lead on what success is all about. All too many Christians have been caught up chasing after that worldly success syndrome. And if we've established anything in this world and we've gained anything, we have found ourselves wanting to chase more. And it truly has left us somewhat empty. You know why? Because the world's way of success never truly satisfies. Today, I want to encourage you to chase after godly success. 
But there are some hurdles that you must first cross. And then there are certain principles that I see in this passage that must be followed in order to see the results. And so let's dive in this passage for a moment and see this little conversation between God and Joshua. Let me give you first point here, the prevention to godly success. What would prevent me from achieving what God has for me? Well, like it or not, before I get to the very first point of this, all of us are in, if you're in a, if you're a born-again Christian, you recognize the spiritual warfare that is against you. This warfare is engaged to keep people, first and foremost, from placing their faith in Jesus Christ. But this warfare is also engaged to keep born-again Christians from living obedient and fruitful lives on this earth. In fact, the battle that is waged against you today is waged by none other than Satan himself. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10 makes it very clear that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, the real enemy I have is my mom and dad, or the real enemy that I have is that authority in my life, or, or the real enemy that I have is this person that has really caused me some consternation. I want to tell you, behind all of that is a spiritual warfare that is engaged by Satan himself and his host. And it's often been said that as Satan wages war against born-again Christians, he may not keep them from heaven, but he may, sure can keep them from living a heavenly type of life here on this earth. You see, Satan has a plan for you just like God does, and he's trying to keep you from living that promised land life and experiencing the blessings that God has for you. Now, notice the context of this chapter here. The Israelites are about ready to enter into the promised land. They had disobeyed God 40 years earlier, and now they're on the brink of getting ready to enter into what God has promised them. And there may be some here today who have found themselves wandering They're out in the world trying to find success. They're trying to gain all the money they can, all the possessions they can, but they've not found themselves happy. And now today, you're going to hear a message of how you can be successful, not according to the world, but according to God's standards. But notice there's some things that prevent, and I want you to see this here. First of all, notice this, a reliance upon other sources a reliance upon other sources. Now, notice the words in verse number two. Notice what God says to Moses. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, I'll tell you, the hundreds of times that I've read through my Bible, almost every time I come to this, I often say, duh, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, if I was Joshua, I would say, look, you know, we weren't there. We didn't see where he's buried, but we know he passed away, and we know he's been taken away, by, in fact, by God himself, and was buried to a place that they didn't even know about, but they knew he was dead. But I think there's something more significant to the phrase that God is giving to Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. I really believe what God is telling Moses is the, or Joshua is this, Moses is dead, He's not coming back, and you're going to have to do what I would have asked of Moses if he were here today. In other words, listen to this, stop trusting Moses and start trusting what I have told you and what I'm going to tell you. Joshua had been the dutiful servant of Moses for some 40 years. Now, let's think about Moses for just a moment. You talk about a God-qualified, man-recognized leader, Moses was it. I mean, you talk about a guy that got out there and was able to lead the Israelites and and have 10 plagues. God used him to bring 10 plagues upon Egypt. Wow, I'd revere Moses. Here's a man that was stood there at the Red Sea when there's nowhere else to go, and God used him to just hold up his rod, and the Red Sea parted so all of those Israelites could pass through on dry ground. 
Moses was the one who was that meek man. While the Israelites complained and murmured and everything else, Moses stood there and he represented the people to God and God to the people. You talk about a great leader. And yet that great leader is now taken out of the way. And I have to imagine in my mind that Joshua is saying to himself, can I really do this? Can I really get out and lead these people? I don't know if I can step into the same shoes that Moses had. I don't know if I could do the same things. And what God is telling him is this. You cannot, if you're going to be successful, you cannot rely upon Moses. You cannot rely upon him as a leader because he's gone. You're going to have to now rely upon me. And how many people in their lives that are possibly sitting here today for their Christian growth, for their relationship with God, they're relying upon their mom, their dad, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a Christian school teacher, whoever it may be, and that's where your relationship with God is through. Now, those people may help you. They may guide you. But you know what God wants from you? He wants a personal, dynamic relationship with you not through somebody else. And I think this was a stark reminder for Joshua. Joshua, Moses is gone. Now it's you and me. And too many people never find God's success because they're always relying on other sources, not on God directly. Notice another thing that prevents here is the raising of emotions such as fear. Now, look at verse 6, 7, and 9. Notice this. It's interesting. The phrasing here of strength and courage. Look at this. Be strong, in verse 6, and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Listen to that. I believe that God is attempting here, if you will, to strengthen Joshua because he possibly had some fears arising in him and fears that wanted to overwhelm his spirit. What fears could those be? Well, fears that maybe the people might become discouraged again like they were 40 years prior. You know, I don't know about you, but if I was Joshua and I was that one, that man who had the good report coming back to the Israelites, and all of a sudden there was an evil report that came, and everybody went and had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, if I was Joshua, I would have been standing there again thinking to myself, maybe not saying something to everybody, but thinking, will these people do the same thing like the other group did 40 years ago? I'd almost imagine there was a fear that he had that possibly the tide could be turned. Maybe there was a fear of maybe we can't do this. Now, the Bible doesn't indicate, and again, I, I, I'm just kind of guessing and speculating here, but I'm, I'm thinking through, what if this were me? All of us, at one time or another, have fears that come along in our lives, If you're not willing to admit that, then you're lying to yourself. Because we all have fears that come about. And Joshua possibly had these fears that came about in his life. But I want to tell you something. God says, Moses or Joshua, don't fear. Be strong and very courageous. Why? Because I've got this relationship with you. You need to trust me and my word. Be strong and overcome here all these fears with courage. I remember reading a cute little story about a little boy that was tucked in bed one night, and it was a massive thunderstorm that was going on. So as the mother came in and went to kiss the boy, the boy said, "Uh, Mom, could you please sleep in here with me tonight? I'm a little scared because of the thunderstorm. And as the mom kissed the boy on the forehead again, she said, I'm I'm sorry, son, but she said, "Uh, your daddy's in the other room, and I need to sleep with your daddy. As she walked away and went to close the door, she heard kind of this mumbling under his lips, big sissy. (laughs) You know, we talk big sometimes, but truly, we need to have that strength in God. I love the story Adrian Rogers used to tell about a man who bragged that he cut off the tail of a man-eating lion with his pocket knife. Asked why he hadn't cut off the lion's head, he replied, well, somebody had already done that. And you know, it's easy to talk tough, 
But what you and I really need in the things of life is to very simply trust God because God will take care of us. Here's the third thing I want you to see about the prevention of success is a reminder of failures in the past. Now, again, let's get the perspective of this scenario. Forty years prior, they had come to this very same point. And because of discouraging news, they wandered in the wilderness. You talk about a failure. And I have to imagine as they stand there, they're thinking, and Joshua very specifically is thinking to himself, I can't believe we had this failure. Can we move forward? You know what I believe what happens with many, many people? Is they have this scenario of, you know, I failed God so many times. I have had this wrong in my life. I have had this moral failure. I've had this problem. I've had that thing in my life. And they say to themselves, I can't do this for God. My friend, there's not a person in here with some type of failure in their life. There's not a person in here who hasn't disappointed to God, and you're looking at one who's disappointed God from time to time. But I want to tell you something. The devil is the one who comes and says, oh, you can't do this. Look at what happened to you in the past. Look at these things there. And that's the evil one that's trying to hold you back. But God is saying, I want you to be strong and courageous and move forward because it's all of what I promised you in my word. Now think about these preventions. There are things, and you can bring all sorts of scenarios of things that want to prevent you from doing what God asks of you. But now I want you to notice what the principles of success are. Look at verse number 8. Before I get into the three principles of success, I want you to notice the first five words of verse 8. Would you say them with me here? Ready? This book of the law. Let's say that one more time. Ready? This book of the law. Do you realize if you're going to have godly success, you've got to have the right source. It's God's Word. Now, he talks about the book of the law. What's he referring to? Well, he could be referring to the book of Deuteronomy, which had just been given to them. That had just been written down, cataloged, and it was a repeating of the law that was given in the earlier times. All they had at that time, if you will, were five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Deuteronomy. That's all they had, but it was sufficient to do what God asked them to do. And God had given this book of the law for them, and here's what he's telling them. There are principles of success that you must follow if you're going to find a prosperous life in the promised land. What are they? I want you to notice, first of all, it is this. There had to be a pronouncement of the Word of God. It had to be a pronouncement. I believe that Joshua and the Israelites were to have their conversations full of the Word of God. It was Warren Wiersbe that used to say, if you don't talk to your Bible, your Bible isn't likely to talk to you. I like that. You know what our problem is? We get into situations of life. We may have to make a decision. We have to, uh, we get into some scenario that we, we find ourselves disillusioned and we start talking about everything else. Well, what does this person say? What does that magazine say? What does the, what does uh, uh, this uh, source out there say? My friend, I want to tell you something. The reason we don't have success in God's Word is because we're not talking God's Word. You know what I love about what it said in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 7? Notice this. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, notice this, and shalt talk of them. When you rise up, when you walk around, everywhere that you go, you're to be talking the Word of God. Can I ask you a question? When you came in here, how many of you were talking up the Word of God? Or are you talking up the the upsets from last night's uh, uh, invitational tournaments with basketball? Or were you talking about your fishing expedition a couple days ago? Or were you talking about something else? My friend, it's not that we can't talk about any of those things, but what is filling our conversation? 
I think our problem that we don't find our way as prosperous before God is because the Word of God hasn't filled our mouth. But notice the pronouncement of the Word of God, but notice, secondly, pondering it. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Are you reflecting upon God's Word continually during the day, at night? He tells us that we ought to meditate upon the Word of God day and night. Now, when we talk about meditation, we get a little confused here about meditation because there's so much else that is said about it in our world. Meditation literally means the act of focusing one's thoughts It means to ponder, to think on, to muse. Meditation consists of a reflective thinking or contemplation. But when people think today about meditation, here's what they think of. They think of the Eastern meditation whereby a person empties his mind. But I want to tell you something. The Bible meditation that is spoken of here and throughout the book of Psalms, is a discipline whereby a person fills his mind with the Word of God. So while the Eastern forms of meditation stress the need to become detached from the world and uh, uh, be, be one with yourself and be one with what they call the cosmic mind, biblical meditation involves being detached from the world from the controlling influences around you and becoming attached to God through Jesus Christ. That's biblical meditation. Now, I want to ask you a question here. How many of you are taking time to meditate upon the Bible? You say, now, Pastor, look, I I, I took the Bible guide back there. I'm reading through, but you don't understand. i got a busy life. I understand because many times there are people ask you, hey, what did you read this morning? You go, hmm, it's almost like that deer in the headlights. You can't remember what you read. My friend, God didn't ask us just to go ahead and make a mile marker of reading through the Bible in a year, though that's a good goal, but he wants us to meditate upon his word. That is to read it and then to think through it, to study it, to, to, to ponder it. In in other words, there is to be taking the Word of God and internalizing it and personalizing it to my life. Now, the only way you can do that is you've got to set time. You say, Pastor, again, you don't understand my schedule. Possibly not, but possibly. But all of us have time to do the things we want to do, don't we? I mean, I know people that when they want to get to a particular activity or they want to go to a restaurant, they're going to go ahead and push everything else aside so they can do what they want to do. And if you truly want God's way, then you're going to have to take some time and really ponder through the Word of God. Let me give you an illustration of meditation. Did you know that a cow has four stomachs? Now, I'm not, that's the extent of my biology lesson today, except for this. You know, here's a cow that he's chewing the grass, and he's taking that grass in, and, and you know, a cow just chews really slow. I mean, just, you, you watch them on the field, it's just like they have nothing else to do. But he's just chewing that grass. And he swallows that grass, and it goes into the first stomach. A little bit later, he says, you know, that was good grass that I had earlier. I think I'm going to call that back up again. Now, how many of you are hungry for lunch? I mean, think about this now. He, he calls that back up, and he begins to, I think the word ruminate here, he begins to go through and chew that again and brings it down to the next stomach, and then he calls it up again. That's the idea of meditation. It's not just reading the Word of God and saying, oh, I did my duty. I read three chapters today. I'm done. No, it is taking the time to ponder, to internalize, to personalize the Word of God so that way when we get into times of struggle or we need to make a decision, we can recall the Word of God. That's what we need. But notice, and this is very crucial, 
Verse number 8, you're to talk of the Word of God, you're to meditate upon it, but notice here he says that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now, verse 7, he says, turn not from it. Verse 8, observe to do according to all that is written therein. You know, I don't think that the Israelites would have had to wander for 40 years if they had just simply practiced what God had said. You know why there's a lot of Christians wandering today in their life? Oh, you may not be in the wilderness, but theoretically speaking, you are in a wilderness. You're wandering aimlessly. You don't know where things are because you haven't taken the Word of God and applied it to your life and obeyed it. The Word of God is that which is to be obeyed. Jesus said, blessed are they that hear the Word of God and keep it. You say to yourself, hey, I'm patting myself on the back. I was in church today. Well, God bless you. Glad you were in church today. But you know the greater blessing is to walk out that door and to follow what God has asked you to do. That's it. Obey God. You look through the book of Deuteronomy. I don't have time to do it today, but Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 through 10. And on and on through the book of Deuteronomy, there is this whole idea of here's the Word of God, practice it. Here's the Word of God, follow it. Here's the Word of God, obey it. Are you being obedient to the Word of God? It's important. But now, lastly, I go through this, and I want you to see the promises of success. I love this throughout this chapter. Joshua is reminded by God that wherever the Israelites put their foot down, God had given that land to them. Now, it's speaking of the provision of the land that God promised to these Israelites. God, God's not talking about a physical land to you, but I want to tell you God has promised some spiritual blessings to you. The promise was of a physical blessing for the Israelites. While you and I, it's of a spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. You realize the blessings of God come in so many different forms and fashions. Our hearts and minds can be guided by the peace of God which passes all understanding. Our lives can be full of the joy of the Lord. In fact, the Bible reminds us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Our needs, not our greeds, can be supplied according to Philippians 4.19. I have access to the creator of the universe when I need help in anything in this life. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption are all mine. I have been created in Christ to now do good, and I have a forgiveness and cleanness that I've never known before. I could take the rest of the time today and go through the blessings one by one, but I want to tell you something. Many Christians are not taking hold of the blessings of God because they're not obeying what the book says. Oh, sure, they've been saved. They've met Christ at Calvary. They know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of them, but they're not taking hold of the very things that God has provided. Notice also the promises. What else has been given here is the promises. God says you will prosper. Notice here the words that are given in verse 8. I love the last phrase. If you talk of the Word of God, you meditate upon it, you observe to do according to all that is written therein, he says, for, notice this word, it's a small word, but it's very important, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You know what God's saying? The promises will not be yours until you follow what I've asked you to do. There's a process. There's an order that God has given to us. And I have a feeling all too many times Christians are just saying to themselves, oh, yeah, I've been saved and I'm given the promises of God. My friend, I want to tell you something. Just like C.H. Spurgeon used to say, Joshua was not to use the promises as a couch upon which his indolence might luxuri luxuriate, but as a girdle wherewith to gird up his loins for future activity. God's promises are prods, not pillows. 
how important it is for us to follow. But notice, lastly, his presence. You read through the Scripture, and God tells him, I'm going to be with you. Isn't it wonderful to know in these verses that we read that God tells us not to be afraid, but he also tells us that he will be with us in times of confusion, distress, You and I don't receive from God some theoretical dissertation on the fact that God's present. God tells us, I'm with you. And he puts down his hand and he says, take hold of it. A number of years ago, when our kids were still at home and we loved to go to the Smoky Mountains, you know, I'm up, grew up in the area not far from where the Townsleys are and got some mountains up there and enjoyed it. But I moved down to Florida, and truly the biggest hill down here was probably the little incline I might have had in my driveway. That was it. And so our vacations were to go back to the mountains. We couldn't often go back to New England, but we would drive up to the Smoky Mountain area, and it was beautiful. I'll never forget walking in, and we went to one of the caves that were there. And truly, if you've seen one cave, you've seen them all. But we, we went in, and Kids had never been, and so I knew that they were going to do this after we got in, and they described everything in there, and you walk through. They were going to turn the lights out. Now, you've never seen darkness till you've been in a cave. Now, I was ready. I had my daughter, who I think at the time was about three years old, and she was standing next to me, and I didn't say anything to her. He said, Pastor, you should have prepared. No, I wanted to see what you do. But I had my hand down, and I stood as close as I could to her. And the man said, all right, now, people grab your kids, and, and we're going to turn the lights off. And all of a sudden, he turned the lights off. And here's what I felt. There's a little hand. Come up and grab mine. And right when that hand came up, I, kn- I knelt down and I said, sweetheart, daddy's got you. Daddy's got you. You know, we walk in this world today that is so dark so confusing, so problematic. And how wonderful it is that the God who created us promises his presence. Isn't it beautiful? As I close here today, I want to circle right back to the title of this message that I gave you, How Can I Have Success in This Life? And I really want to ask you this question. What are you chasing after? What are you doing to climb that ladder of success in order that somehow you will gain satisfaction and have this happiness? Well, I want to remind you today if somehow these words have not come through that the real success and joy of this life is when you make this book a companion of yours. This book has to be a companion. Has to be something you get into each and every day. Read it, meditate upon it, and study it. Because all of us need it. You know, I believe that the devil is doing all that he can to divide us, to divide and fragment our thinking. I think he's trying to get us preoccupied with all sorts of other things. He's trying to get us confused. He's trying to give us, get us to live independently of God. And I want to tell you something. Somebody has once said that the adversary majors in three things in our lives, noise, hurry, and crowds. And how important it is for us to get away from the noise and all the hustle and bustle of life and the crowds of everything and get alone with God and His Word and get to know the God of heaven. Can I say to you that if you never reach the ladder of success that is determined by this world, if you're living week by week on your paycheck, or, and you don't have much, by the way, of a house, much in your bank account, or you're not driving things that look really uh, great, can I tell you that if you don't have all those things, but you've got a dynamic relationship with God and you're following His Word, you are successful. Amen. Yeah. You're successful. You're prosperous. 
Because prosperity is not in what I hold in my hands. Prosperity is what has been given to me that is intangible by God above. The true spiritual blessings from God. I think it's high time for all of us to make a decision to get into the Word of God. Some here today need to make a decision to begin reading the Word of God. You say, Pastor, I've not really been reading the Word of God. Make a decision today to start getting in the book. We've got guides back there at the Welcome Center. Grab one and say, I'm going to follow this plan and read the Bible. Some of us need to start taking time to meditate upon the Word of God. You've been rushed in your reading, but you've not taken time to ponder, to muse, to think it over, to apply it to your life. You need to start doing that. But I would dare say all of us here need to obey God. We need to follow God. Maybe God's coming through and pinpointing some area in your life, and He's telling you, Here's an area you need to obey, or we ought to do it. May we bow our heads, please, and close our eyes. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed here today. Nobody's looking around. We have something here we call an invitation. It's a point in time where we invite you to make a decision upon what you heard just now. So I applied it at the end. Some of you need to begin reading the Word of God. I want to encourage you and invite you to come and make a decision to do that. You say, Pastor, I could make the decision right at my seat. Yes, you could. But I'll tell you what. When people begin to get up and they come and they come to what we call an old-fashioned altar and they lay their life down, they say, God, I'm willing to do what you'd ask me. I tell you, it goes a long way. So this morning, I want to encourage you to make a decision to read your Bible. Why don't you come and pray? Submit yourself to God. Some of you need to start spending more time in the Word of God by meditating upon it. Why don't you come and do business with God? It may very well be that there's decisions here that need to be made that I didn't even touch on today. Maybe you're here and you've never been saved. I want to encourage you. If you want God's prosperity, if you will, could I use it that way? If you want the success that I spoke about, the first thing you must start with is a decision to receive Christ as your Savior. Could I ask you this? If you died today, do you know where you'd go? Yesterday, we were out in visitation, and I asked a few handful of people that question. If you died today, do you know where you'd go? I tell you, it's amazing the answers that come along. Well, I, I'd hope to go to heaven. I, I think I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. My friend, if you have any doubt at all or don't think you're going to heaven, then before you leave this building, would you come up front and see one of the people? And they'll gladly take a Bible, show you how you can know Christ as your personal Savior. That's one of the main functions of our ministry here is to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. And would it be that you'd place your faith in it? Maybe you've been saved, never been baptized. Why don't you come? Maybe you'd like to join Calvary Baptist Church. Last week we had a dear couple, Dave and Debbie Richards, come for membership, and we praise the Lord for that. Maybe God's t- tugged on your heart about that matter. Whatever it is, we'll have people in the front here. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you to come and make decisions for God. Let's stand to our feet together, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let me pray, and when I say amen... Why don't you come and do business with God? We'll have folks here. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us and help these people to make decisions according to your word in Jesus' name.